All right, welcome back everyone. Up next, we will have Luis Garza again. He'll be presenting chapter five on easement requirements. Thank you for the introduction, Katie. Um, as Katie said, I'll be I'll be presenting um, these updates to the easement requirements. Um, also here joining us on the line is also uh, Monic Mitra, supervising engineer uh, from Houston Public Works Stormwater Operations and Gabriel Musio, supervising engineer in drinking water operations to help answer questions during the question and answer portion of this presentation. Here's an overview of the changes made to the chap to chapter five easement requirements. We'll cover changes to the chapter inclusion section, talk about easement requirements that were in other chapters within the IDM, highlighted a new ordinance requirement for restrictive reserve easements, and provide water line easements, sanitary sewer easements, storm easements, and combined storm and sanitary sewer easement changes. We've updated the chapter includes section of chapter five. We clarified the scope of chapter five by clarifying that easements for electrical and gas lines are not covered by uh, the city's infrastructure design manual. Also, it was identified that the utility coordination committee um, was dissolved in 2007. And so references to the UCC were removed from this chapter. During review, it was identified that easement requirements were scattered throughout the water line, wastewater line, and storm water chapters. To make our requirements easier to navigate, we have moved easement requirements from those chapters to chapter five. For clarity, some reference article numbers were added to these chapters to link the two chapters when needed. If there were duplicate requirements in both chapters, we remove the duplicate requirements in either of the chapters. For example, requirements for water meter easements were duplicated in chapter five and chapter seven. The articles in both chapters were consolidated into one set of requirements updated in chapter five and removed from chapter seven. Recently, the planning and development department updated the city of Houston code of ordinances regarding tracks for non single family use reserves. As shown here, reserves for lift stations may require a temporary access easement. As an informative reference, paragraph 5.2.04B was added to chapter five as a link to this ordinance requirement for lift stations, wastewater, and water facility easements. The water line easement section was updated this review cycle. The large amateur water line easement table was moved from chapter seven, appendix A to chapter five. All table notes were updated from the 2021 version. The easement size for new pipe for a new pipe range um, for 42 inch to 54 inch diameter pipes is 30 feet now, uh, while 24 inch to 36 inch diameter pipe easement width um, has been reduced from 30 feet to 20 feet. Notes one and two relate to the location of the large diameter water line within the easement. Note one requires the water line centered within 20 feet, 20 foot easements. Note two requires 10 foot clearance between the center line of the large diameter water line and the easement boundary. Notes three and four relate to additional permanent or temporary construction easements for the case where the large diameter water line depth is greater than 15 feet as measured to the bottom of the water line. This table is referenced within other water line easement requirements. So let's move on to those other requirements that were updated. Waterline easements not contiguous with the public right of way must now meet all of the following requirements. It is clarified that the width of the easement is equal to twice the waterline diameter plus the depth to the bottom of the waterline. A new requirement was added that rounds the easement width to the nearest five foot increment. And lastly, although the minimum easement width of 20 feet was not changed, a new reference to table 5.1 large diameter waterline easements was added to capture the minimum large diameter waterline requirements. As shown on the previous slide. 
Easements contiguous with public right of way has been updated too. Both small diameter water line requirements were modified to include placement location within the easement for consideration of future use of the easement. The size and pipe location considers a future water line being placed in the same easement at some future date without the need to increase the easement. Water line easements for water lines 12 inches in diameter and smaller have been increased from 10 feet to 15 feet, with the center line of the easement placed five feet from either easement boundary. Water line easements for water lines 16 inches to 20 inches in diameter have been kept at 20 foot minimum. But a new requirement that the center line of the water line must be placed seven feet from either easement boundary was added. And large diameter water line easements are according to table 5.1, minimum easements for large diameter water lines, which was presented a couple of slides ago. Easement requirements for water lines placed within five feet of the right of way have also been updated. These easements are contiguous with the right of way since there is limited room between the water line and the right of way. These two sub articles have been updated. The water line diameter range has been updated to be from 16 inches to 20 inches, uh, but the requirement was kept at 10 feet minimum easement width. Sub article three, however, was added and refers to the easement defined in table 5.1 minimum easement for large diameter water lines for this particular case. There are a few other water line easement requirements that were added. Paragraph 5.2.04.C.1i restricts the use of side lot water line easements uh, to be used only if they eliminate dead end water lines. It also requires that the side lot easement must be accessible for maintenance. And two requirements were added on the water line location within the easements. Water line 16 inches in diameter and greater are not allowed in side lots. And for side lot easements that are centered between two lots, the water line must be centered between the lot line and the easement. And for example, if there's a 20 foot easement, the water line must be five feet from the easement. And that places the water line on that Place, place, sorry, placing the water line on the lot line is no longer allowed for these type of easements. More noteworthy changes to be aware of. Provide all weather access for water line easements unless one already exists. For these updates, easements less than 10 feet, fire hydrants were not allowed. Now, Fire hydrants must not be placed in any water line easements. Center flushing valve um, within must be within a size five foot by five foot easement when the valve is located outside of the right of way. And that concludes the changes made for water line for the water line section of chapter five. We'll now move on to wastewater line easement changes. There were a few changes made to the wastewater line easement requirements. Most were the result of general changes listed here. A distinction between the easement requirements for gravity sanitary sewers and force mains was made. This resulted in various requirements for force mains uh, that were added. Similar to water line requirements, wastewater easement requirements were relocated to chapter five and article number references were updated to match the new article numbering. The qualifying conditions for gravity Gravity sanitary sewer easements or other combined easements not adjacent to the public right of way has been updated. The qualifying condition used, used to include all three conditions. Now condition three, um, if the easement is not adjacent, adjacent to the public right of way, easement or fee strip um, can be used as a qualifying condition alone. So due to modifying and to or here at the end of condition two, um, that that allows that third condition to be a qualifying condition alone. And this concludes the changes made to sanitary sewer easements in Chapter 5. Storm water line easement requirements have been changed significantly this review cycle. 
I'll present the two major changes. Most of the other changes were the result of bringing Chapter 9 requirements to Chapter 5. On this slide is Table 5.2, Minimum Easement Requirements for Storm Sewers. It replaces the requirements of 20-foot minimum easement for all storm sewer sizes. Minimum easements range from 20 feet to 30 feet and are set by the size of the storm sewer. Note 1 requires the storm sewer to be centered within 20 foot easements unless the storm sewer is within a combined easement. Note 2 identifies that the storm sewer should be centered in the easement unless the storm sewer is within a combined easement. For storm sewers that cannot be centered in the easement, it sets the horizontal clearance of the storm sewer at eight feet from the easement boundary if the depth is less than 15 feet and 16 feet from the easement boundary if the depth is greater than 15 feet. In note three, an additional 15 foot permanent easement is required for sewers that are deeper than 15 feet. The depth of the storm sewer shall be measured from the bottom of the storm sewer to natural ground or final ground elevation, uh, whichever is greater. Similar to water lines, new minimum easement requirements for storm sewers located within the right of way, but where the exterior of the pipe is less than five feet from the right of way it was created. The easement contiguous with the right of way must be a minimum of five feet from the outer wall of the power of the sewer pipe and between three to five feet from the right of way. The easement contiguous with the right of way must be a minimum of 10 feet when the outer wall of the storm sewer pipe is less than three feet from the right of way. And Article 3 requires an additional 10 foot easement to be added to the easements in sub articles 1 and 2 if the depth is greater than 15 feet. And the depth is measured similarly to the storm easement table on the previous slide. The previous version of the combined storm and sanitary sewer easement section of this chapter was difficult to follow. Before I get too deep into this requirement, uh, this chapter requires to maintain a minimum horizontal clearance between utilities as required by Chapter 9 and other chapters of this IDM. That said, this standard review committee improved these requirements as follows. All combined easements shall be rounded up to the nearest multiple of five feet. For combined storm and sanitary sewer easements not contiguous with the right of way, minimum easement width shall be according to the appropriate storm or sanitary paragraph as referenced in this article. The center line of sanitary sewers must be not less than 10 feet from the easement boundary. And the horizontal clearance between the exterior and any storm sewer and either storm boundary is as required by note two of table 5.2 minimum easement widths for storm sewers. Um, and that is the table that we that was just presented a couple of slides ago. Now we'll move on to the improved combined storm and sanitary sewer line easements contiguous with the right of way. Article 3 combined easement widths shall be as specified by the minimum easement width for storm sewers table or the depth of the proposed sanitary sewer line. Article 3B, when storm sewers are placed nearest to the outer easement boundary, a clearance between the exterior of any storm sewer and the outer easement boundary must be according to note two of table 5.2, minimum easement width for storm sewers. The outer easement boundary in this requirement means the easement boundary that is the furthest offset from the adjacent public right of way. This term is defined, is a defined term in this chapter. Although not shown here, the 10 foot clearance between the center line of the sanitary sewer pipe and the outer easement boundary applies as well. A supplement will be issued shortly as this was accepted by the standard review committee, but not captured in the 2022 edition of the IDM. Keep an eye out for it, that supplement on the HPC website in the near future. And although these articles are pretty clear, the standard review committee decided to add a figure to the IDM to help with clarity. It is as shown on the next slide. Both cases shown in figure 5.1 have utilities at a depth less than 15 feet. Case A is where the storm sewer is nearest to the outer easement boundary, and case B is where the sanitary sewer is closest to the outer easement boundary. As can be seen in both cases, the 10 foot distance between the outer easement boundary um, and the sanitary sewer line is maintained, 
and the minimum eight foot clearance between the storm pipe and the outer easement boundary is maintained in these two examples. So that concludes this part of the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat at this time. Thank you, Luis. So let's start with the first question. Side lot easements seem to be allowed for water lines if they eliminate a dead end. Will the city allow back lot easements for water lines? Will the city allow back lot easements for water lines? Um, no, back lot easements are not allowed for water lines. Okay, thank you. The next one is when you have a water line behind the curb and a storm sewer parallel behind the water line, how do you fit both in front of the building when building line when most building lines are no greater than 25 feet? Does the city now allow overlapping easements? So um, I have, I guess, you know, two two experts here with us, um, both Gabriel Musio from uh, Drinking Water Operations and um, Monica Mitra from Drinking Water Operations. Um, you know, from from my understanding, and gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, water line easements are are um, are dedicated only to water for water lines only, um, and so the IDM doesn't allow for that at the moment. Um, I don't know if you all have any any thoughts on this question. I mean, I agree with you there. The water line easement uh, is only meant for the water line, so that they shouldn't be overlapping. Um, honestly, I, I'd like some clarification on when building lines are no greater than 25 feet. Do you mean, do you mean 25 feet? The, you're talking about the building, um, the actual like structure itself, 25 feet back from the right of way, from the edge of the right of way. Because it sounds like what you're alluding to is the uh, the storm easement and the water easement side by side would probably take up uh, that whole 25 feet, right? I can read again the question to you if you want. So it says, when you have a water line behind the caravan storm sewer parallel behind the water line, how do you fit both in front of the building line when most building lines are no greater than 25 feet? Yeah, the I, city. I, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I got it now. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. that's going to be left up to the um, the engineer to 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 figure out how to squeeze those utilities in there within the IDM if a variance is required. You know, if one would have to be submitted. Uh, otherwise, that building structure um, may have to be. Uh, if it's a new structure, they would have to look at the, uh, where they could potentially place it. If it's not a new structure, you know, and they're developing the utilities, they would they would have to look at that as well. Up yeah, to the and, UR is what I would say. And Gabe, I think that you know it's possible that that operations and that that can be discussed also with with the city is, is on a case by case basis. Is is that right? Yes. Yeah. So that's also a possibility. Okay, I'll go to the next question. So the next question is, all weather access is mentioned. Is there a minimum width that the driveway needs to be? I mean, I would imagine the minimum width would have to be the width of the easement. Thank you. Yeah, on that one, Gabe, I think maybe we should, uh, we should, uh, they might have to, to, um, they might have to comply with other requirements within the IDN. Uh, I think it, it'd be prudent for us to to check back with uh, our team here at HPW to make sure that that we're providing uh, you know some helpful direction here. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm sorry about that. And uh, looking at the other questions, I think a lot of them too would, would need to be answered by other teams within HPW. Thank you. Yeah, and so we'll we will respond to to you know to these questions uh, in the IDM Q and A uh, document that will be posted on the HBC website in the near future. So anything that we can't answer here, we'll, we'll we'll do our best to to get that question answered from a team member here at Houston Public Works. Thank you so much, Luis. So let's go to the next presentation. 
So our next presenter will be Mr. Anthony Powell from Geospatial Services Group. He will present Chapter 13, Geospatial Data Deliverables. Thanks for the introduction, Sahar. And good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to review the changes and additions that we've made this year to Chapter 13. In general, the, the name of the chapter was changed from GIS Data Digitization Standards to Geospatial Data Deliverables. The chapter was also reformatted. The intention there was to consolidate similar sections into global sections to eliminate repetition. As a result, now Chapter 13 contains overarching sections on data collection, data accuracy, asset specific information, um, data quality, and electronic deliverable requirements. In general, continued, uh, we also added a reference section to reference the city code of ordinances and other documentation relevant to this chapter. And we also ex um, expanded the already existing definition section to define the importance or frequency, frequently used terms within the chapter. As for changes made pertaining to the actual utility sections, each utility section, each utility has its own subsection located un now under the newly created asset specific sections. Um, we added a section with asset descriptions in order to define all of the stormwater assets. We also moved all of the specific feature class information from stormwater to Appendix A within the new geospatial data deliverables properties guide. Now what Chapter 13 primarily contains for the stormwater assets is an information required for stormwater assets table, which we included to match similar tables that were already in Chapter 13 for water, wastewater, and the geotechnical environmental utilities. This table shows all the stormwater assets and what information is associated with them. Within the water and wastewater utility sections, which are also now located under the newly created asset specific section, um, we clarified the language to refer to wastewater asset descriptions rather than wastewater feature classes, and we removed the references to specific feature class names and subtypes to avoid having to change the IDM chapter when schema changes are made. As mentioned previously, projection and accuracy statements um, were removed from the individual subsections and placed in a separate section of the chapter. The specific asset requirements are now more concisely shown as a table. The table shows the assets um, and associated required information. This essentially condensed the information into an easy to read table, um, moved away from having specific fields called out by the name and looked to summarize the primary information that should be provided. Here you can see screenshots showing the specific information required for both the water and wastewater utilities identified in the tabular format. The geotechnical and environmental sections had the following modifications. Again, as mentioned previously, all projection and accuracy statements were placed in a separate section of the chapter. Um, to continue consistency, the specific asset requirements for the geotechnical and environmental assets are now more concisely shown as a table. The table shows the asset and the associated required information. This essentially condensed the information into an easy to read table that summarizes the primary information that should be provided. The new subsection also clarifies deliverable format requirements for boring and boring test result data. While a file geodatabase is still the city's format preference, 
boring and boring test result data may still be delivered uh, in an Excel or CSV format. Now new this year is the Geospatial Data Deliverables Properties Guide. This document provides a detailed breakdown of the geospatial data schemas associated with storm, water, wastewater, and geotechnical environment, environmental asset feature classes maintained by the City of Houston Public Works Department. The property guide is, is meant to be read in conjunction with Chapter 13 of the Infrastructure Design Manual. It will be updated as needed, which will allow the city to communicate detailed changes in data to the public as soon as they occur. This document can be found on the Design and Construction Standards page on the City of Houston, Houston Permitting Center website. It's located on the, under the Infrastructure Design Manual tab. The Houston Public Works Department has committed significant resources and efforts towards implementing a value-added enterprise-wide GIS electronic project delivery process. The goal was to modernize the delivery process and to reduce the man hours needed to create project information from the engineering as-built drawings. This process will result in having a more up-to-date and reliable GIS inventory while also making information available to the public quicker. The new deliverable requirement is that an electronic project data deliverables must adhere to the guidelines outlined in Chapter 13 and the new properties guide. An, an ESRI or ESRI file geo database must be submitted via the application at the link located on the slide. Shape files will not be accepted as a submission format. The only exception is for boring and boring test result data, as we stated previously, um, in an Excel or CSV format. The step-by-step -step process for deliverable submission can be found also within the properties guide. Um, this, this concludes the revisions made to Chapter 13 and the new Geospatial Data Deliverable Properties Guide. So I want to thank you for your time. And, and with that, we have any questions? Thank you, Anthony. Uh, yeah. We have a few questions here for you. Okay. Uh, so the first question is, uh, who is responsible for submitting the file geo database for project deliverables? Okay. Um, the engineer of record is responsible for submitting the geo database. And if you could refer to the section three and five of chapter 13, I believe, um, for more details on the GIS data collection and, and the deliverables. Um, okay. OK, uh, another question here. Uh, when will the new deliverable process take effect? The new deliverable process has already taken effect. Um, the web page that, uh, that you saw on one of the slides, um, that link is up and running. Um, it's ready for submittals at any time. Um, the requirements for electronic deliverable submissions will go into effect when the new 2020 2022 IDM takes um, effect. OK. Uh, another question here. Um, what software uh, should we use to create the file geo database? That's a good question. So there's actually no need for anyone to create a file geo database for, for yourself. Um, the new electronic deliverable site is where you'll, you'll be able to go to there and you'll be able to download a file geo database template um, for, for the different data sets. So um, you'll download those from the site and when you're ready to uh, make your deliverables to, um, to complete your project, you will then load your data into that, to that geo database template and you'll load your project data um, 
um, go back to the site to that site and there'll be there's links there that would allow you then to upload um, those those file geo databases containing your the data for your project. OK. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, are let's see, are geo databases required for private projects? For chapter one of the IDM, GS data deliverables are required for projects that are uh, proposing or modifying assets identified in chapter 13 that are or will be operated um, or maintained by the city. OK. Um, another question here. Uh, how often will the uh, the new uh, properties guide be updated? The guide will be updated uh, on, an, on an as needed basis. Um, updates for the guide won't follow the standard review cycle like the IDM will. Um, the goal is to communicate specific changes um, in the schema and the feature class information to the public as, as soon as they occur. OK. Um, another question. Uh, who do we reach out to with questions later on, uh, either about um, Chapter 13 or the new properties guide or the deliverables process? So for questions uh, about the documentation uh, presented here, either Chapter 13 or the new properties guide, um, you'll be able to reach out to the design and construction standards group and by finding contact information on the design construction standards website, I believe. And for questions regarding GIS data, um, specific schema questions or um, questions related to the deliverable process um, located on the on the link there on the site in the web page or landing page, uh, you'll find contact information that you'll be able to leverage there. OK. Um, another question, does geospatial submittal require um, for all CIP projects? Yes. OK. Um, let's see. Um, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, are all GIS requirements for all types of city infrastructure currently in Chapter 13 of the IDM? Uh, or are there some additional requirements outside of Chapter 13? All GS requirements for private and public GS data are located in, in Chapter 13 of the IDM um, and now in the newly created properties guide. And between those two documents, you should be able to find all the information on the GIS requirements. OK, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I believe that's sure. all the time we have for questions right now. So uh, with that, let me introduce our next presenter. Uh, Ivy Wang is with the Office of the City Engineer at the Houston Permitting Center, and she will be presenting Chapter 9 for Stormwater Design and Water Quality Requirements. Uh, go ahead, Ivy. OK. Thank you, Sahar, for your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivy Wang with the Office of City Engineer. For chapter nine, this time we only just have the one change in detention calculation for section 9.2.01.H, 3B1 and C, which only impact single family residential lots of 15,000 square feet or less with a shared driveway or common driveway, just these two cases. Previously, in the detention calculation for single family residentials, 15,000 square feet or less, 
with shared or common driveway in section 9.2.01 H3B1. Any proposed shared or common driveway could not be part of impervious area calculation to get a 65% reduction. They have to separate the calculation to calculate detention as required in the another paragraph, which is 9.2.01 H.3C. You will see the next page, which is the, this paragraph. We will talk about a little bit later. Let's back to that paragraph. In the new revision, IDM allows you to include proposed shared or common driveway to be part of impervious area calculation to get a 65% reduction. This line underlines in red reflect this change. That's the only change in here in previous area for any shared driveway or common drives will be divided equally among all lots with the SFR development. Regarding to this proposed change in paragraph 9.2.01.H3B1, shared driveway or common driveway turns removed. So those red lines will be removed from this paragraph. Let's look at the next revision. So for this uh, deal revision, all shared driveway or common driveway turns has been cleaned out. Keep in mind, this change only impacts single family residential lots of 15,000 square feet or less with shared driveway or common driveway. So this concludes the modifications made to chapter nine in new revision. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat. And that's okay, thank only you, I have. Yes, Ivy, we've received some questions here in the chat. Uh, the first okay. question I have is, does the new rule apply to any single family residential lot in a subdivision? No. This change is not uh, uh, apply for the subdivision. Subdivision detention, we have a separate calculation. There's no change. Thank you. OK, um, another question I have here is. If each lot is a different size, do we divide shared or common driveway proportionally to calculate the impervious area? That's that's a really good question. Now be sure it will be divided equally or evenly. OK, thank you. Um, we have another question that's come into the chat. Um, this question says. It's 9.2.01 H point two C. It says if you disturb or improve even a tiny piece of a city alley, then you need to provide detention for the entire alley. Is that block by block to block? Can you put the detention in the city alleyway? And even there's a third question part part of the same question is even for one home in the middle of the block, um, I guess will you need detention? Uh, keep in mind this this time we 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 didn't change in any detention calculation or impervious area regarding to alleyway, and also respond to this question is it depends is this a public alleyway or private alleyway? Uh, 
for the private alleyway, if you have detention, you can put it into the private alleyway for your detention. You can address your detention in there. Uh, use some sort of ways to address your detention. For the public uh, uh, alleyway, we don't we don't recommend to do that. So you have to keep your detention in your private side. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the last question, even for a home in the middle of the block, I guess, do you need detention? Yes, detention is always a tr uh, triggers. Uh, if you have any any impervious area, you, you must uh, provide the detention. There's no question. Okay. Um, there's a, there was another question that was asked a little earlier. I'm not sure if this is uh, too project specific or not, Ivy. Um, it says 9.2.01D.4C states fences cannot be built across drainage easement. Why is that if you do, why is that if you do underground detention only and all of it is tied into the underground system? So no sheet flow where fences, sh you know, that there's no sheet flow where fences should be. I'm not sure if that's that's kind of a, a clear <laughs> question. Yeah, um, th this question is uh, kind of a little bit, uh, you know, uh, unclear. So I would like to get uh, uh, the people who ask this question, maybe example we can answer correctly. Uh, but in January, I can answer yes. You couldn't you couldn't build your your fence across Eastman, but she also yeah now she flew from one property to another property or to the city right of way. Now Shifu, you have to maintain your Shifu in your private side. Um, I'm not sure if I, I really answered to the question, but uh, I, we, we can get a, you know, resource, somebody yeah, who asked this question, we, we will probably uh, uh, answer in our co and a document uh, to uh, in near future to answer this question. Yeah, if the if the person that asked the question, if they could reference the same uh, article number and 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 uh, tell us whether that answered the question or if you have a follow up, um, like Ivy said, if if we're not able to get to it by the end of this webinar, we'll try to to clarify um, based on your your clarification. Um, so we'll 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 try to do that. OK, Ivy, um, I, as we wait for more uh, questions here to come in, um, I guess there's a, a, another question here. Um, is there a guide to help me calculate storm detention? Uh, yes, a couple of weeks ago, we posted some detention calculation examples over HPC website. You can get it from there. Great, that's that's great to hear that we have that resource uh, for the public. OK, um, I guess Ivy, as a, we're waiting for any other questions to come in. Um, is there anything that you'd like to highlight? We have about a minute left here in this part of the presentation. Is there anything, um, you know, in Chapter 9 or, or something here in OCE related to storm that you'd like to highlight? Just in general? Uh, in chapter nine, chapter nine, or something the department's you know been been up to something something to share with the public. Okay, yeah. Uh, my group, uh, I'm just the manager engineer uh, for Storm Group, who overseeing our group with the Office of City Engineer. So we have a two two groups under me. There's a we call BCE group and OCE group. So BCE kind of we are, you know, our majority job is plan review. So BCE group kind of they're doing just a plan review for our code enforcement plan. And the OCE group were kind of doing the, uh, the right of way plan review or you call the plan profile. Yeah, so that's in the city uh, uh, engineer office. So that's uh, kind of our orange chart like that. Okay, so. okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ivy, for, for, for telling us more about your group and, and the things that they do. Um, we'll, we'll be moving. Thank you for your presentation and answering the questions. We'll be moving on to our next presenter. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Sahar Bezadek. She's a, a, an engineer here in the Office of the City Engineer in the Design and Construction Standards Group. Um, she will be presenting changes made to the construction specifications. Take it away. Thank you, Luis. As stated earlier, construction specifications and standard details are part of the review cycle. You can find the specification red lines on the City of Houston Design and Construction Standards website under Standard Review Committee tab. Also, 2020 through 2021 standard specifications will remain online for reference for construction projects that were bid using those specifications. The link to those can be found under the construction specifications tab. Summary of revisions, which is located on the first page of standard specifications, can be referenced to keep track of changes made in each review cycle. Our intention is to keep these lists in this document for five years to supply a record of updates through one full five-year review of all HPW specs. This list also provides updates of the standard details during each review cycle. Let's focus on the specifications. The spec updates are broken down into three categories. New specifications, specifications with major updates, and retired specifications. In the next few slides, I'll talk more about each category. This year, we have three new specifications. Specification 1582, Build Houston Forward Project Identification Signs. This specification is provided with, with a new standard detail. I will present the highlights of this spec with the drawing in standard details update presentation later. Specifications 2445 and 2447 are provided due to the latest changes in boring methods industry. Mr. Marcus Mengesha will present the highlights for these specifications after my presentation. Retired specifications. As I explained in the previous slide, new requirements for boring methods led us to provide two new specs, and one of these spec specifications replaced the existing outdated specification 2447, which is called, uh, which was previously called Augering Pipe and Conduit. Last group to present are specifications with major updates. Major updates category means the changes were made based on the review cycle coordination and external comments. These changes are not administrative. Because of the time limitations, I'll go through some of the headlines in this presentation, but you can check the specification red lines for all major changes made to specifications in the new edition. Specification 1145 was revised to add the project manager to the governing authorities to gain approval prior to impeding or closing public roads and streets. Also, a paragraph added to clarify that all buildings, driveways, and parking lots throughout the project shall be accessible. Electronic submittal method added to 1340, specification 1340, for shop drawings and product data. Specification 1725 was revised to specify the amount of time to inform project managers to 14 days in advance of recovery of horizontal and vertical control points to avoid late notices. In both specifications 1770 and 1782, payment for operations and maintenance data and also testing and adjusting equipment revised to reference specification 1292. 
Here is a list of some of Division 2 to 16 changes with major updates. Specification 2441, microtunneling will be presented by my, uh, Mr. Marcus Mengesha. Specification 2501 was revised to show that double wrap encasement is required in open cut method for water lines. And specification 2526 water meters was revised to be consistent with the dimensions given in IDM for 8 inch and larger water meters easements. There are still more changes in Division 2 to 16 specifications that because of lack of time, I address you to red lines to see those changes. That concludes this portion of the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat. Thank you, Thank you for that presentation, Sahar. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, that have come in so far. I guess the first question um, is, um, were there any guide specifications that were updated to this review cycle? Uh, no, this year we didn't have any guide specifications uh, to be updated. Uh, maybe next year we have guide specifications, but this year we didn't have any updated guide specifications. Okay. Another question I have here is how many specifications were updated this year in total? So this year we had a total of 12 specifications with major updates, uh, although many of those updates were in Division 1 specifications. There are still Division 2 to 16 specifications such as microtunneling that were updated as well. Also, we have updated some specifications due to, to the, uh, for addressing, you know, the new specifications that we had. Uh, I mean, uh, specification 2445 and 2447. Uh, another uh, update we had in uh, specification, uh, Division 1 specification uh, 1502 for mobilization. So we addressed uh, the new specifications uh, for uh, uh, built, uh, built Houston for ward sign specification. We address that specification in the mobilization specification as well. OK, thank you, Sahar. Um, there's a question here. I think I, I'll, I'll answer this question. Um, is the pu is Public Works going to update the City of Houston Division 0 and Division 1 um, construction specifications to the current CSI numbering format? Um, this question, I think, you know, are, um, our group here in uh, Houston Public Works um, has, um, you know, are aware, aware of CSI's updated numbering format. Um, I, I think there are other departments within the city that are using uh, that may be already using that updated format. Um, although those those discussions have been happening, I guess here at the city in general, um, at this moment um, for public infrastructure, you know, Division Zero and Division One, um, or sorry, Division One at least. Um, and two through sixteen, um, with you know the 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 specifications that our group here in the design and construction standards group um, really maintain and update. Um, at the moment, we are not uh, looking to update those numbers, um, you know, so far. Um, and so I think that discussion will continue to happen within uh, the city of Houston um, across departments. And um, you know, once there's uh, some agreement uh, between our departments. Um, Maybe there'll be a path forward and in, in, in to making those updates in the future, but at, at the moment there we are not uh, making that update. Um, there's another question that was that's asked here. Um, will let's see. I have to go back up to it. Um, where can we get the city organization charts? Um, I think there's uh, here on the line in Houston Public Works. I think one of our our uh, presenters. Um, here is saying that uh, that's something that uh, Houston, the Houston Permitting Center is working on for uh, some org charts uh, that might be available to the public in the near future. Um, Katie, is there anything to, that you might want to add to that? Um, no, like right now we have our uh, phone list for all the plane review sections, which kind of gives you at least a hint at what our org chart is, but we'll work on a more visual display to better clarify how the Houston Permitting Center works with our various partners and departments. Thank you, Katie. 
And I think that that concludes the amount of questions we can ask and answer can be asked and answered in this portion. So uh, Sahar, please uh, continue on and maybe. Pres uh, yeah, so. What we'll do now is we'll move on to the next presenter. And so our next presenter here. Is. Uh, Marcos Mengesha, he's the acting uh, assistant director um, in capital projects for uh, facilities. Uh, he'll be presenting microtunneling, jack and bore and slurry bore specifications. Marcos, please take it away. Thank you, Lewis, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. And today I'm going to be presenting on some of the changes on micro tunneling, jack and bore, and the slurry bore specifications. These are very similar type of installations which are primarily used for water and wastewater projects. And the first part of the you know, presentation is going to cover what is the existing specification? The existing specification 2441, which includes micro tunneling and pipe jack tunnels. And this specification covers micro tunneling and other type of you know underground trenchless installation, which are pilot tube, jack and bore, and jack and mine. The last two are very similar type of installations. And the question is. What are the reasons you know, we change or modify this specification now? And the answer for that is one, the specification covers multiple type, multiple you know, tarantulas installations, and that creates <clears throat> some you know, confusion as far as which equipment should be used during construction. And this specification is somewhere around 20 years old and uh, the industry has evolved over the last 20 years, and we have seen some growth on micro tunneling. We have seen changes on pilot tube, you know, guided boring machines as well. And each of those equipment has its own, you know, you know, benefits and some limitations as well. And the other thing is, you know, the, the lack of clarity on this specification exposed the city to unintended risk. And that result to project delay, inconvenience to the public, and requires design revision during construction. That pr pretty much adds, you know, a, a process on the project delivery, and it affects the project, you know, time as well. And you know, when you go to the second part, and the proposed recommendation is, we have to have two, you know standard loan specification. One is to keep 2441 for micro tunneling only. That's going to be used for installation of sewers and casing pipe by micro tunneling. The other specification is going to be 2441, which is this is a new specification introduced for jack and bore, jack and mine, and pilot tube boring tunnels. These are the three are very similar type of installation. Uh, as far as the pipe sizes and the drive they can, you know, uh, do and a little bit different from micro tunneling. That's why we group those type of installation in one specification and that in, is intended for installation of sewers, casing pipe by jack and bore, jack and mine, or pilot to boring, <coughs> guided boring type of installation. The intent is to provide clear guidance to engineers, contractors, and project managers to select the appropriate method of installation, to minimize unintended changes during construction, set a clear expectation prior to bidding. Some of the issue is during bidding, contractors assume based on the information provided, the work can be done by you know, uh, a number of you know, three or four type of equipments which have similar you know, uh, delivery. However, some of you know during design, we select uh, the type of installation for reason because of you know, uh, impact to the surface, the public, 
all the factors into consideration. That's how we pick type of installation for underground construction. So that will eliminate or provide a clear expectation during bidding. You know, by doing that, we can save time during some mirror reviews. So what is included on the general section for micro tunneling 2441? Uh, we added related sections. That is really just to show you what is related to this specification. Most of the tunneling specs are related to this type of an installation. Some of the pipe materials and some of the uh, trenchless installations are later sections to this specification. The definition section, we added you know, some of the definition related to micro tunneling only. And uh, there are some new definitions added just to support what is included in micro tunneling. The submural section, yes, we did modify submural sections. It's very similar to the old, you know, uh, 2441. However, we requested, you know, a work plan that's typical for uh, micro tunneling installation. You need to know the scope of the work and how the work is going to be executed. The drawing and calculation, those are typical for micro tunneling. One, the jacking load, all that calculation has to be provided by the contractor. Those informations are only for record purposes. And qualification of key personnel. This is you know, very unique type of installation. Uh, the, the success of the installation is you know, heavily depend on the personnel who is you know, uh, operating the machine. So we did, we did include qualification of key personnel for reference only. And uh, that's something you guys can find on the specification. When you go to part two, this is a product section, micro tunneling, you know, uh, as you guys know, it's, it's very, you know, uh, the jacking load requires you to select appropriate type of, you know, pipes. Those pipes are fiberglass, vertified clay, plastic lined reinforced concrete pipe and reinforced concrete pipe. Those are the type of pipe materials and load for a jacking pipe. In this specification, we did add a steel casing pipe requirement because casing can be installed by micro tunneling as well. This section is you know, uh, modified to include steel casing, some of the grout lubrication, and the water pH requirement. When you go to part three, this is you know, uh, the most important part of you know, any uh, underground installation. The reason for that is you know, how do you execute it? You know, this is the equipment, you know, the yes micro tunneling has you know, a lot of accessories included. That's you know, slurry pressure balance, you know, uh, air pressure monitoring. Those are the type of the uh, equipment can be used. The remote control system, pipe jacking equipment, slurry separation equipment. Those are the equipment which are you know, needed to fulfill uh, micro tunneling installation. And this section includes what is required in detail. And the part we added or modified as part of execution is the monitory section. Yes, an underground installation requires monitoring because of for settlements, you know, we have to protect critical structure near or around uh, the installation, which can be close to the shaft or along the alignment. And we did include or modify the frequency of you know, uh, monitoring uh, requirements and some of the references for uh, ARMA standards. That's for railroad crossing. On section three, and the acceptance criteria is very important for you know, uh, gravity uh, sewer systems. And the existing ac acceptance criteria we do have is plus or minus six inch theoretical at any point between manholes, for so that's for horizontal, we changed it to plus or minus 6% of the micro tunneling boring machine diameter or two inches, whichever is greater. For the vertical acceptance criteria, plus or minus for one and a half inch, that was for the existing spec, we did modify it and changed it to plus or minus 3% of the micro tunneling boring machine or one inch, whichever is greater. This is the most important part of the spec, which is required to 
accept uh, the asset at the end of the project during testing. And uh, I want everybody to be you know, familiar with it. And the, the new spec 2441, the jack and bore and jack and mine, those two are very similar. And the pilot tube is more condensed version of micro tunneling equipment, which doesn't require you know, a separation plant. This is more, this, this specification is intended for dry bore installation. So this is a new specification and installation of pipe by jack and bore, jack and mine and pilot tube. And the sections part one, two, and three. Yes, we did create a new section for you know part one, the general section. It's very similar with the micro tunneling, uh, but you know this is specific to this drivable type of installation. The product section, uh, yes, you know this is going to be drivable, and it's very similar to you know uh, micro tunneling. The jacking pipe requirement is still the same. The execution, yes, equipment is needed to do one of these three type of driver type of installations, and we did include you know, or specified, you know, the required equipment or and how that's going to be utilized. So the next part is what is the similarity and the difference between the two specification? As I said. 2441 is intended for micro tunneling. 2445 is intended for other driver type of installations. And the general section for 2445 is a specific for, you know, uh, jack and mine and pilot tube, the similar requirement and the drawing and calculation required as part of the Samira is a specific for that type of installation. And when you go to execution section, uh, yes, this is a specific pilot tube as it has its own, uh, you know, uh, criteria. So the construction operation criteria is specific for pilot tube, jack and bore, and jack and mine. Yes, the equipment is going to be used is different, and you will find that outline on the section of the specification. When you go to similarity. Yes, both these are in both specifications are going to be used to execute sanitary sewer project and the payment terms are going to stay the same. It's very similar type of payment terms and the product section is very similar. Jacking pipe criteria is still the same for both specifications. Yes, the execution part, the tunneling data, control of line and grade and monitoring is very similar for both specification. The other new specification we added on this you know, uh, review cycle is 2447. This is an installation of water line by slurry bore. 2447 uh, was an existing specification which was intended for augering pipe and conduit, which is both dry and slurry type of an installation. That specification is retired and we introduced a new specification only for water line installation. And uh, as part of you know, this modification, uh, one of the reason is you know, the communication conduits still are going to be you know, you, you know, installed in accordance to specification 16709. And this specification is going to be standard law for water line installation only. The general section, yes, this is an installation of water line up to 20 inch. This is considered as small diameter water lines by slurry bore method. And we are going to use this specification to install casing up to 24 inch diameter. And uh, this specification has its own requirement for, you know, some mirror requirement, especially the work plan contingency measures if the project or the plan doesn't go as intended. Those are specific to the specification and I recommend you guys to get familiar with it. And the second part is, you know, part two, you know, product section. Yes, this is going to be for water line. The carrier pipe is going to be in accordance to 2511 for water line and the steel casing pipe. Yes, the steel casing up to 24 inch. Uh, you know, the requirements set in accordance to the specification as well. Yes, we did add a special requirement for this section 
which is going to be applicable for waterline installation. Part three, execution. Uh, this is a slurry board, and uh, the execution section includes, you know, uh, all the requirements, the execution requirements, and uh, some of the acceptance criteria, equipment that's going to be used to execute this project in accordance to 2447. That's all I have. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I will stay on the call. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. We have questions here for you. Let me check and start with the first question. Okay, so the first question is, do the updates to 2441 and 2445 change the payment terms for sanitary sewer installations? No, the payment term for both specification is going to stay the same. We are going to pay for line installed per linear foot. That's going to be similar for both specification. Thank you. We have another question here. Does the updated microtunneling specification cover curved microtunneling installations? All right, that's a good question. So the curved microtunneling uh, this is, you know, because the industry has evolved for the last 20 years and we start seeing curved micro tunneling installation, especially in the North America. And we did install one project which includes, you know, curves in the city of Houston. Uh, we used a Hobas pipe, which is 16 inch. And the answer for that is as part of design, we are not planning to design a project at this point with a curved micro tunneling. However, most of the curved installation in North America was done by you know, value engineering that was proposed by a contractor during construction. So we will be open, we will be open for value engineering to be submitted or contractor can propose if that's something they can do as part of that project. Thank you. And the next one is, can the method of installation be changed or modified during construction? All right, that's a good question. You know, the purpose of, you know, this amendment to the specification is to limit some of the changes we have been seeing in construction. That was the whole purpose of, you know, modifying the specification. At least we can provide clear direction during bidding so contractors, they will you know, bid accordingly. That means if it is a micro tunneling inst installation, it will stay as a micro tunneling inst installation. If it is specced to be installed by 2445, jack and bore, jack and mine, or a pilot tube, that would that can be in, done with those specific in those equipments as well. But sometimes, time to time, you know, the you know contractors you know, propose a value engineering to you know uh, eliminate some additional shaft or to minimize impact to the public. We will be open to review any proposed changes during construction, but I strongly recommend contractors to follow the general condition, which they do have only 90 days to submit those in a proposal for review and approval. OK, and another one. Uh, does it require specialists, for example, licensed contractor to work on micro tunneling construction? What well, micro tunneling is very specialized type of an installation, and uh, even in North America, there are very limited contractors who do who practice on this type of an installation. The, the reason for that is it requires micro tunneling equipment. That is, you know, uh, it requires investment as well. Uh, yes, this is very specialized installation, and those contractors who do qualify, who do have the resources to do the job, has to be, you know, to execute the job. And uh, yes, this is very specialized installation. And we are not, you know, we don't, you know, pre-qualify contractors during bidding. Uh, we don't do that, but uh, strongly recommended, you know, uh, contractors who can do the job uh, should be the job. Thank you so much, Mr. Marcus. OK. Thank you.
I will present the next part of this presentation to you. So let's go on. Back to the summary of revisions, which is located on the first page of standard specifications. This year we have one new standard detail, zero standard detail with major updates and zero retired standard details. I'll talk about the new standard detail 1582 titled as construction sign build Houston forward in the next slides. As you may know, Rebuild Houston has a new name and renewed purpose. It is now Build Houston Forward. Following Harvey, the city committed to build forward and not build back the same way. So Rebuild Houston projects are now named Build Houston Forward. A new web page is designed to introduce the Build Houston Forward goals and projects. In this regard, Houston Public Works designed the Build Houston Forward project identification sign and provided a new specification and drawing to utilize the requirements for the sign. This way, the new specification 1582 Build Houston Forward project identification signs and general detail 1582-1 construction sign Build Houston Forward were created. The provided drawing number 1582-1 is located under the general tab, general details tab on the website. Now general detail 1582-01 titled Build Houston Forward Construction Sign will be used for all Build Houston Forward projects and general detail 1580-3 titled construction sign will be used for other projects. As I explained earlier in the specifications presentation, specification 1582 aligned with the detail provides instructions and details about material, fabrication, installation, maintenance, and removal of Build Houston Forward signs. According to this spec, Build Houston Forward identification sign could be a 24 inch or 48 inch diameter sign that can be installed either by concrete footing, surface mounting, skid mounting, or pile driven posts. Requirement for each criteria is explained in the spec. Payment for this item will be measured by each sign installed and maintained at the project site. And the sign coordinator is responsible for content, layout, lettering size, style, and colors for fabrication. The detail shows the fabrication and installation requirements for both 24 inch diameter and 48 inch diameter signs such as installation location from the edge of pavement or curb which is at least 24 inch from the edge of the street or curb the sign plate punched hole locations and the installation instructions The details for skid mounted installation are provided in the same drawing 1582 for both 24 inch and 48 inch diameter signs, including post and bolt dimensions and sizes. For installation with concrete footing, the details in existing drawing 1509-1 should be referenced based on the notes provided in drawing 1582 and existing drawing 1509-1A should be followed for surface mounted post installations. That concludes the standard detail presentation. If you have any questions, please submit them through the chat. Thank you.
Okay, so Hari, thank you for, for presenting that. Um, I think we have a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, one question here is, um, why wasn't the other construction identification sign standard details retired? Uh, there is a, uh, uh, we didn't retire them because there are, there may be other uh, uh, service lines, uh, not including HPW, may still require those uh, construction identification signs. That's why they are still there and we haven't retired them. Maybe Houston Airport or uh, General Services Department uh, still use them. OK, so maybe other other city of Houston departments might be use, still using those. Yes. OK, um, here's a second question. Um, two sizes are proposed for the Houston build forward sign. Um, who decides who decides um, what size of the sign shall be used? Uh, the engineer of record will decide the appropriate sign size for each project. OK, thank you for that clarification. Um, I have another question here. Um, what are the main differences between the rebuild Houston sign and Houston build the build Houston forward sign? So, you know, the main visual change is that that can be identified easily is that the, the previous rebuilt Houston uh, sign was a rectangular sign, but for the build Houston forward, we have used the uh, circular size. Also, we have added a QR code to the sign that, uh, you know, it uh, forwards the persons that uh, scan that QR code. It forwards them to the website, to the Build Houston Forward website. OK, uh, Sahar, um, we have a couple of more questions here, I believe. See. Um, uh, it, here's a question. Is the is the sign made by a private fabricator or will the sign be made by the city? The sign will be made by the city. Uh, the sign coordinator will, be, will coordinate all the details and the contractor shall, uh, you know, receive it from the city city shop. OK. Um, OK, and I think we have. One more question here. Uh, we do have a question that came in. The construction sign specification 1581 doesn't mention measurement and payment. Uh, should we pay for it under mobilization bid item uh, during construction? So right now we are talking about 1582. Uh, for 1581, I'd like to ensure it with the, our team. So let me check back and then we will respond to this question in the IDM Q&A documents that will be posted on the HPC website. I mean, Harry's uh, Houston uh, Permitting Center website. OK, uh, there seems to be uh, someone commenting here um, that GSD does not use those signs. And so that's we're um, that we're, that's something that that was written there. I'm not sure we'd have to we'll check with GSD if, it, if that was something that they they are submitting here in the chat, uh, but that's something that was that was uh, put into the chat. OK, great. Thank you for. Revising me. And there, there modifying might also, me, yeah. yeah. And like you said, we'll, we'll take a look at that question in detail. There might be a clarification here whether they're, they're actually asking uh, for 1580 in that question, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll take a look at that and respond like you said. Um, on the HPC website Q&A document. Um, so Sahar, I think that wraps up uh, the amount of time for uh, your portion of the presentation. Uh, so thank you for, for spending the time to explain that new standard detail for us and spec. Thank you, Luis. So now we'll be moving on to closing of um, our ID 2022 IDM webinar. Um, our next presenter is Mary Back here in the Office of the City Engineer, uh, Managing Engineer. Uh, of the design and construction standard group. Thank you, Luis. We're now at the closing of the webinar. To recap from the beginning of the webinar, 
October 1st, 2022 is the effective date of the new design criteria. For private public sector projects, you must submit substantially complete plans prior to October 1st to be grandfathered under the 2021 requirements. We received a question earlier on 90% submittals for capital projects. To clarify, if the 60% was submitted prior to October 1st, you will not have to comply with the new 2022 IDM requirements. You will, however, have to include the 2022 specifications and the new standard detail in the project manual. For additional background, refer to the 2022 IDM announcement and IDM executive summary. The IDM summary is provided at the beginning of the IDM document and gives implementation information for the IDM, standard specifications, and standard details. Before we proceed to the final Q&A, I'd like to discuss the upcoming 2022-2023 review cycle. August is the beginning of the new review cycle. The 2022-2023 review cycle will cover chapters 15 through 17, along with the related specifications and standard details. This includes the traffic, miscellaneous, and pedestrian realm chapters. For more details, go to the Design and Construction Standards website, where the public notice and proposed comment form can be found. Both city employees and the public can submit comments to the Standards Review Committee inbox. Please follow the instructions at the top of the form. The email subject should include the words review cycle and the name of the document in need of updates. This will help us better filter requests so yours isn't missed. This year's open comment period is August 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2022. The 2023 IDM publication is estimated to be on July 1st, 2023. And now I'll open it up to additional questions. Please type them in the chat and include the IDM chapter number, specification number, or standard detail number with your question. Okay, uh, Mary, it seems like we, we do have a question here um, that has come in. One question is, what is the difference between this City of Houston IDM and the City of Houston Code of Ordinances? Where each, where are each should be applied and are they interchangeable? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, they are two different things. Um, Code of Ordinances is approved by City Council. The IDM is design requirements that are approved by the city engineer and the director of public works. There may be some overlap between the two. Our goal here in this group is to refer to the ordinance instead of spelling out the requirements if they're in the IDM. That way we don't have um, a disagreement there. So yes, there is a, a difference. Um, typically we will reference the code of ordinances though when it applies in the IDM. Yeah, so Mary, I guess maybe that could be considered like the, the city city law, the code of ordinances may, may be considered city law where the IDM or design requirements and like yeah. you're saying, they, they just can't conflict with each other because uh, we don't we wouldn't want to conflict with the city law. Correct. OK, thanks for that clarification. Um, here's another question. I think I, I'd like to open this up to anyone on our panel uh, here um, to answer this question. Um, you know, what is the limit? of the application in relation to Harris County re regulations, um, City of Houston boundaries, or BTJ? Um, that's quite a broad question. Um, and so if there's anyone on our panel that would like to, to weigh in a, a bit on that, um, I'm not sure how, how specifically we could get, we could get there because those are, are three different types of uh, requirements and regulations. Um, is there anyone on the panel that would like to, to, to discuss this a bit? Louise, I think it's a pretty broad question, so it'll probably be best for us to answer it in the Q&A. Okay, yeah, and I'm sure there are nuances there too on which which requirements the city um, in the ETJs is, is uh, you know, is, is dead set on requiring 
um, and how that 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 whole works. So yeah, I, I agree, Mary. That makes sense to me. Um, and so here we're here at 250, and so um, this this section of the presentation is really to answer any additional questions that are coming in. So um, please ask away. Um, we received another question here um, for Chapter Seven. Um, it's in regards to Chapter Seven, and it says, "What are the backflow preventer requirements for combined water meter that serve as domestic and fire water lines?" We are getting conflicting comments from different reviewers on different projects, and so I think from Houston Public Works, you know, maybe uh, Gilbert Portillo here, uh, managing engineer over, um, I guess, water lines and water line reviews here in, in Houston Public Works may be able to answer that question um, or weigh in on that. Uh, Gilbert, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, right now we're interested in protecting the public service, um, main, the public water line. And so the public reviewers and the city engineer's office are most likely asking for an RPZ for those types of connections. Um, while inside the property, they may be looking at more isolated to the building. So the RPZ would be the requirement um, in most cases. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you, Gilbert, for that clarification. Um, I have a, a question here. Um, I'm guessing that 3D models um, as details are not part of the current manual as drawings. RDWG in 2D. Um, yes, uh, currently so far um, the standard details for the city are in 2D um, and uh, the requirements that are there in the IDM um, are are um, based on 2D 2D drawing requirements. Um, so that, that's the answer to that question. Um, there's a another question, I guess, um, that um, that is written here. Um, can you clarify what you mean by IDM requirements for project 60% submittals submitted prior to October 1st, needing to follow new standard specifications, but not new IDM requirements? Uh, did I mishear this? Yeah, I think that 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 might be a a miss a miss here there. Um, Mary, uh, would would you like to give more more background on that? I think they kind of got it right. So basically, if the 60% was submitted prior to October 1st, you won't have to comply with the new 2022 IDM requirements. That's the design requirements. The construction specifications are a different story. So if your design does impact those construction specifications at all, or the new specifications impact would impact the design, then you'll have to reconsider. Um, this is a grace period that we're giving to help with designers. Um, but our construction contracts do require that the latest construction spe standards construction specifications be used on contracts when they bid. So that's the reason that the new standard specifications must be used. There is not a grace period for them. And I guess on a on a basic level, those construction those specifications are construction requirements that affect uh, the contractor and how infrastructure is is constructed uh, versus. Uh, the infrastructure design manual requirements, which are engineering requirements for design, um, and so um, it may not be necessary, might not necessarily impact design. Um, you know, new construction requirements may not necessarily impact design. I think might be um, the reasoning behind that. Okay, uh, another question here is: uh, Is there a variance process to the IDM? Um, apologies if you have covered this topic. So I think anyone on the panel can answer this. Uh, there is a, a variance process um, to the IDM. Hi, Luis. I, I can answer that one. Yes, for privately funded projects or publicly funded projects that's defined in the IDM, those variances are submitted to the Office of the City Engineer. And you can go to the Houston Permanent Center website, and it's actually under the Design and Standards website where you click on IDM to see that form. Um, for capital projects, you have to follow a different process through the capital projects group. Yes, and Gilbert, I guess maybe to expand on that, it includes its capital projects, including operations and OCE. Um, 
in 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 aiding and helping in their decision. Is that is that right? No, um, what I what I was saying is design contracts with the city. Mm -hmm. That's better defined by the IDM. Those projects are get a variance through capital projects department, but all other private development, privately funded projects, they submit a variance directly to the city engineer's office. And there's a form available on the Houston Permanent Center website. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, here's another question that's come in. Uh, does the city of Houston plan on giving a presentation on document, the 700 document uh, specification, general conditions like we have for the IDM? Um, I think maybe I'll answer this uh, to my knowledge and, and anyone can correct me here. Um, uh, but to my knowledge that the city does not have, I mean, Houston Public Works, at least in the office of the city engineer, our group in the design and construction standards group um, do not have um, a 700 document general conditions webinar uh, planned here in the future. Um, if anybody else within Houston Public Works uh, has any information that we don't, uh, please feel free to share it. But I, I think the answer is no to this question. And I think judging by the silence, I will take that as a no from our panel. Yes, so I guess from here, is there anyone on the panel that would like to, um, I, I don't see any other questions that are that have come in yet. Um, so is there anyone else on the panel that would like to say something before um, we we move on to the to final closing? OK, uh, thank you uh, uh, um, panel for for giving your presentations today and um, I don't see any new questions in, in, in the box here. Uh, so Mary, I'd like to, to pass it back to you for final closing closing of this presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Luis. If you have additional questions, feel free to send them to the design and construction standards inbox. We will be posting a recording of this webinar a few days after this event. Go to our website, use the IDM tab, and scroll down to the video links. They will be posted under the IDM webinar heading. Thank you for joining us. We hope this was informative. Take care, and we hope to see you again next year.